I still think it's fun every time that happens. I, I still miss the one that Bob had, though. Bob just sounded, it, it's just so much better as Robert Brindley. Right? But that's okay. Poor, poor Bob. He's not with us anymore. <laughs> oh, that's so sad every single time that you say that. Doesn't get any better. Well, this is what our second one in February. Time just kind of flies by. Right. And then soon enough, more, more holidays, though. So that's good. Well, holidays that involve, like, maybe getting some relaxation with all, all the work going on and everything. And then VMware is being super awesome. They're also giving us a day off on Friday to help right. everyone with just everything. <laughs> so that means that not only do we get two four-day weeks in a row, but we also get one four-day weekend. It's true. Which is pretty sweet. Is and then, of course, off? we're... Hmm? Sorry, Tiffany. Is there a day off on Monday for you as well? Yeah, it's President's Day. Uh, sorry, lucky, sorry for lucky you. you for, <laughs> lucky you. And we actually well, have a president almost worth celebrating for once. Well, yeah, finally. <laughs> right, I guess I do need it. Okay, so those are US holidays <laughs> that we have. <laughs> all good. All do you good. have, do you have Friday off or no? Yes, we do. Uh, we, it's like okay. I'm in Germany here, uh, but we don't have holidays to celebrate our presidents here that's that would probably give a <laughs> false impression in terms of german history being uh, proud of your your what is it head of state or how do you call it mm -hmm. um, we've made weird experience with that <laughs> to phrase it politely yeah that's true um <laughs> so you're in germany what uh what is the vacation situation there like? Do you get uh, a lot of public holidays? Just a few? I th I think there's some some law some uh, there that you as an employee of a company you have a certain amount of days to, just paid holiday. Mm -hmm. And I think in Germany we have thirty roundabouts, so almost six weeks of um yeah just paid vacation. And that, that's why I'm totally fine with you folks in the U.S. just having right. an occasional uh, celebration because we have, of course, we have public holidays as well, and um, uh, they, they often fall on 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 work days. So it's all good, I think. It's all good. And I'm You're not quite happy. at the at the Sweden thing where you take like three months off for winter and three months off for summer. Well, we should maybe, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, right now. I mean, we're pretty snowed in. That's kind of like uh, a bit, a bit weird. Uh, it's had, it has snowed for two days in a row now here, at least in Dresden. So, let's just snow here this week in Seattle. Okay. There is even a threat we might get some snow next week in uh, Austin. Oh wow! Yeah. Interesting. Oh, the, Will you be goose... flooding down your driveway with a cardboard? Uh, 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 if if my driveway ices up, I will uh, do another sledding down the uh, driveway. Now, I, when I posted that video, I turned the audio off. But right as I started going, Kelly shouted out, look out, there's a truck coming. And uh, there wasn't. But it did give me a brief moment of worry. This, okay, because this is why you leave I was committed. That's true. Yeah, so leave the audio. You can remove it later. All right. All right. Can't um, so I Chris mean, of Wild can, just asked weird. us if paid vacation is a thing in the US. Uh, and yes, it is, but it's not quite as protected as it is in other places. So in a lot of companies, v VMware is excellent. So I don't want you to accidentally think that VMware doesn't give us amazing Yeah, products. ours is good. Uh, but there are companies where for the first couple of years of working with them, you get zero paid holidays, paid vacations. Oh, wow. Um, apart from the public holidays. And then you slowly start earning it like one week and a few years, you get two, two weeks. Okay. Um, 
Aren't we on vacation now? Oh, Bob! Aren't you on vacation? Oh, hi, Bobby Brindley. Well, I mean, this is this is Paul, and like, I don't work very hard, so in a way, I am on vacation all the time. <laughs> um, uh-huh. You know, the trick is to start when you start a new job be as unproductive as possible and just set that as the expectation <laughs> and then you're golden the worst thing you can do when you start a new job is to be really productive and really good because then people have expectations on you and i think tiffany is learning that the hard way is we all expect so much from her because she's been so amazing when she first started um we should probably do the news yeah and, I, and so gonna, i was gonna oh go ahead mm-hmm. I was going to go from vacation stuff into our next fun thing next week. What's our next fun thing and, next week? And accidentally lock my screen in the process. So, wow, you, you suddenly became the tiny little person in the corner. That's Wait. fun. Um, oh, no, it's not showing it. It should have my screen up. What happened? It broke. Oh, no. Oh, no. This is the worst day of my life. We had one, with one job software. <laughs> Let's try it again. No, it's not no. showing. I that's just like watching so flash bizarre. back and forth though. That's really funny. It's showing it on my preview. Oh, this is terrible. Um, what if I do this? I really want to, I really want this to work. Let me just try this real quick before we give up. Um, is it something I could share? What about now? Do you see my screen now? Nope. Still no? This is the worst day of my life. All right, I'm going to do it the old fashioned way and I'm just going to do a screen share. Um, It was going to be cool because it was going to pop up behind me. But sadly, uh, Zoom and OBS decided not to play uh, nicely together. That's okay. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to share this right here. Oh. All right. So what is going on? We have uh, Tanzu Tuesdays, which is this show right here. And coming up next week, Tiffany. Um, we are reviving our previous run of people playing Among Us, which is partially us folks and some people who have been attending our show and some people on other teams or other companies. And we're just going to be doing that as our first thing back. And so if you want to chime in in the chat like normal and kind of discuss or if we have spots open or whatnot, um, just like be with us as we uh, do some red drum as uh Josh Long calls it, yeah. aka murder. Uh, and I think we'll be seeing Tasha back. Uh, hopefully, we'll be seeing um, Tyler. Will be, I hope I hope Tyler's playing. Uh, sweet Killer Nine, are you going to join us? We should figure that out. Yeah, I already and, asked. Uh, oh, sweet. And what about little Bobby Brindley? Is he going to join us? I don't know. All right, we should figure that out. Anyway, that's Tanzu Tuesdays. Uh, we also have coming up, I believe we have Mark Heckler on next week on Code. Uh, and yep. he's doing Assume Nothing, a dead simple introduction to application security. And I said next week, I mean tomorrow. Uh, and that is at 11 yeah, that, o'clock Pacific time. That's not, uh, Wait, that's not right. Well, that's not right. I'm sorry. I proved your PR without che- double checking the time on the that worst, one. I checked the time on the, the other one. the worst day of my life. I'm sorry. So it's 12 p.m. Um, PST, I was checking right? in meetings, yes. It's 12. Yeah. I think I must have done some sort of weird search and replace error trying to be clever. Um, so 12 p.m. PST, we'll fix that in a moment. Uh, and we'll be doing live coding, exploring security concepts in spring. And that's pretty exciting because everyone loves security. <laughs> cool, and Bob's in. Right. Uh, and then... Uh, TGIK is actually having a day off on Friday because we're all getting a day off on Friday. So uh, lucky TGIK. We should have done Tanzu Tuesdays on a Monday so we could get Mondays off when we have public holidays. So maybe next season of Tanzu Tuesdays will be Tanzu Tuesdays on Monday. (laughs) 
because between chair and keyboard also has a week off because that is on Mondays. And so that will be, I think, is next week is off, but then Mark Heckler will be the first guest back after that week off on the 22nd. Uh, and so Mark's being pretty popular right now. He'll be code tomorrow and then uh, between chair and keyboard or as uh, little Bobby Brindley would call it, between keyboard and chair uh, on Monday the 22nd. Uh, and then uh, I just wanted to highlight Cote uh, and what he's been doing, because he hasn't really been keeping to a super regular schedule, but he's been playing with doing like short little bits um, rather than what, big long videos. And so he's, I think he's doing some stuff on Twitch and then editing, editing them down for like really short, like punchy YouTube videos. And then he's doing like the TikTok influencer, like YouTube, like fancy graphic, you know, with That's pictures kind of himself of doing weird things. Um, so if you want like a short, like, let me see, is DevSecOps just another buzzword? Probably like two minutes. What are we looking at? Oh, it's not gonna tell us right here, but it's probably just a few minutes of, uh, of stuff, but really good content. So I highly recommend if you've got you know, a few minutes here and there to spare, uh, have a look through some of Cote's videos there. And that is it for streams and shows. So why don't we switch to upcoming conferences? So the first one I wanted to mention is DevOps Days Texas. And this is a conference that I'm helping organize. And basically all the Texan uh, DevOps Days organizers got together and were very sad about the fact that we're likely having yet another full year of no in-person conferences. And to uh, commiserate and still find a reason to get together, we're holding just a DevOps Days Texas and we're bringing in uh, the best of uh, Texas speakers and outside of Texas to uh, really kick that off. So that is the second and third. Um, we just closed our CFP and we had some amazing uh, stuff that uh, we will hopefully be accepting today or tomorrow. Uh, and hopefully by next week, I can give you a lineup of some of our speakers and they are going to be fantastic. Uh, it is free to attend. It'll be up on uh, YouTube. And then we have a Discord that we're setting up for in-person chatter, for doing open spaces and some of the other fun uh, DevOps Day stuff. Then Tiffany, what's this DevNexus thing? Yeah, so basically it's a pretty big Java related virtual conference that's free. Um, so anyone can attend that. Um, so we have a bunch of our team speaking there. So Mark Heckler, Josh Long, Nate Shuda, um, our previous guest that is not this Ollie, but the other Ollie. So Ollie Hughes has a talk as well. And so that's gonna be on February the 17th. Awesome. Did I miss anything? Nope, I think you got that. Uh, and then finally is another conference we thought was worth calling out, the Global Diversity CFP Day. Uh, and they have uh, workshops and stuff happening on uh, February 20th uh, in your region. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through this, but basically um, in all of these regions you see up here, uh, they have workshops and stuff in your time zone presented by people that are somewhat local to you. Uh, and that's pretty awesome. So if you are interested in that, uh, go ahead and sign up for it. And I think that is the news. Uh, what about your find... contour thing? Oh yeah, I forgot about that. The contour thing. Let's see if we can- And after you do that, if you wanna drop it. onto the guides section of our site. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Let's just go straight to the guides. We can post a link to my thing in chat because I lost that um, doc we had open. Um, but let's go to Topics Kubernetes uh, because we have a couple of exciting new things listed in here. Um, pop, blop, 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 blop. And oh, so basically, this is on the same site. If you go to tantu.tv, if you just go to topics, there's like there's blogs, there's topics which have guides of like getting started, et cetera. There's workshops. All that is on the same website. So let's highlight this thing right here, written by our very own Tiffany Jernigan. 
Um, so me. Tiffany, in like one sentence, what is Valero and why do we care? Um, basically it's used for backing up and restoring your clusters, whether it's your existing in your existing cluster or to another cluster. So you can have backups and recover from those as well if something happens. Nice. And and so that's good for not just back up and restore, but I guess you could also use it to migrate workloads Migration. from Kubernetes cluster to another. Cool. And it also deals really well with um, like vistas and volumes and stateful sets and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. Nice. Yep. Um, we also have some new Contour content up there. And we'll post a link to, I just did it. There was a Contour 1.12 or 1.12 was just released last week. And so I did like an hour and a bit stream of just playing around with that. And so I installed it using the new Contour operator and then tested out some of the new features like uh, rate limiting and uh, different types of load balancing uh, techniques. Uh, and it's really, Contour is really starting to close the gaps between uh, ingress and uh, service meshes. So you can get some of the features of a service mesh without needing to install 80 billion containers to get SEO running. Uh, and that's always a good thing. And I think that is definitely enough of the news. So let me stop this. Yeah. And uh, Oliver, why don't we, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Who are you? Where do you live? I think we've kind of covered that, but go through it again anyway. And what do you yeah, do um here? Um, I'm Oliver Dortbaum. I live in Dresden, Germany, and I am part of the Spring Engineering team and have been for over a decade, actually. Um, there's this funny thing when, when, when we usually met at Spring One and we go like for dinner um, as a team, it's usually the most senior person, not meaning in terms of like job levels, but like who's the longest with the company sort of has to take the bill and um, that one year when it first hit me, it was kind of like, oh, wow. <laughs> well, I'm, I've been <laughs> around for a while. Um, I, of course, can expense it, but still it was kind of a, a bit of a surprise. Yeah, so I've been doing this for quite a while. Um, I have been leading the Spring Data Projects for most of the time. Uh, but someone else, is, like Mark Paluch, is taking care of that. I've handed that over to a team member and am busy with all things framework and architecture these days. So everything that has architectural impact in the framework, like some bits in Spring Framework itself, uh, we're gonna to get to talk about this, um, but also in the uh, ecosystem around it, like Spring Data Projects or um, connection to domain-driven design um, or even R&D efforts that sort of are not yet tied to the framework or, um, yet. Um, but might be in the future exploring space here. So that's kind of what I've spent my, my days with these days. You're muted. For those of us who aren't super familiar with uh, Germany, Dresden is in the south, right? It's southeast. In the, in the east and then in the south. So it's like yeah. one, 100 miles from south of Berlin, basically. Mm -hmm. So... So you can yeah, I caught a train from Prague to Berlin, and I'm that's, pretty sure I passed through Dresden. Yeah, that's 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 going yeah. through it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. I, I guess I don't think it was quite Dresden, but there's like a a really nice river with all these like really nice like I don't know vacation properties and hotels uh, and stuff. That's the River Elbe, I guess. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. you you the train from Prague to to Berlin slash Dresden. Um, goes goes along that and it's pretty pretty nice countryside especially in uh, late 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 summer when like all the trees are mm -hmm. getting colorful and yeah it's a nice ride yeah I remember doing that train because it was from going from one conference to another so I didn't have a lot of time but I remember yeah. thinking this would be an amazing place to spend uh, a few days in in the middle of summer to just it's relax nice. definitely yeah you haven't been I've been to Prague in Berlin, but I haven't been to Dresden, and I've also been to Cologne. That's the but like quite the other Hamburg. side of yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All nice cities, actually. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, in Munich. Whenever, <laughs> yeah, you have to go to Munich at some point, right? If you're in Germany to see the Hofbräuhaus and whatnot. So the right. classic now, tourist. Now, what is 
what is the food that Dresden is most famous for? Like, is there a really regional food? Oh, geez. That, um, so it's the area of Saxony and there is like my, my mother's family is from the area actually. And I mean, there's, there's a couple of, of things that I think are, I mean, that I've just learned to learn to like, that sounds bad, but <laughs> that I've like, <laughs> I've grown up with, right. And that might be just like weird to some other folks, but it's hard to describe even. So I, I'm not, I mean, there is the <clears throat> one, one very regional thing is the Dresdner Christstollen. It's something like a, it's like a, uh, some baked, it's not even a cake really. It's, it's even hard to describe it. You eat it for Christmas and they sell it on Christmas, Christmas markets. And I have to look that up. What is that thing yeah, called? You should, you should, uh, you should share your screen and show it to, to us. That. Yeah, yeah, me neither. Uh, Chris, Christmas Stollen, it says. Okay. But, butter Stollen cake. Yeah. So it's it has... Oh Jesus! It's 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 funny because I'm I'm speaking English like day in and day oh. out. With, yeah. With, okay. I I know what it is. It's like a, it's like halfway between bread and a fruit cake. So yeah. it has like fruit and nuts and it has in it. raisins raisins in it and right. um, uh, and there's like special special flavors or there's like special bakeries even within Dresden that that produce mm -hmm. that and uh, people come to dress and from all across the country to actually buy and then eat that um but it's a very seasonal thing as well yeah um, i might have to see if uh we have a german bakery nearby that uh would have that we have a couple of german influenced towns around austin texas okay and so I, it's probably likely I, around christmas time i can find a decent stolen yeah yeah sure i mean especially if they have some kind of Christmas markets or anything. Sorry to me. Right. One of my favorite things are like the uh, rum marzipan balls that one of my, that they, I can find them in like Munich and one of my friends just sends me them and they're glorious. Yeah. I'm not into I'm alcohol not that much. So I or can... some other burst. Yeah. It's like, like Germany is a very meat, meat heavy country. So you hardly find any traditional non meat dishes at all. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, well, I mean, I, I personally I, eat meat, but um, I, I guess the uh, the, the non-meat dish we think of when we think of Germany would probably be like sauerkraut, right? The yeah, cabbage. but that's usually served with the bratwurst. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so back with with that, but yeah, yeah. I sure. guess sauerkraut would be a weird meal to have on its own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's for sure. That's for sure. Cool. Um, and then if you were able to be anywhere in the world right now and it was safe, where would you be? Where would you choose to go? Oh, Jesus. Um, actually, like from, from vacation destinations, yeah. I like, I've, I've always liked the trips I made to the US and I've never been to Canada mm -hmm. really. So um, anything we, we were like planning when, when spring one was supposed to happen in Seattle, we were actually planning to go up to Vancouver and, uh, do a do a trip like just rent a, a trailer and then mm -hmm. uh, spend some time there so yeah I like these kinds of vacations so I'm not sure that this snowy time is a good time to be in Canada in the first place unless yeah, it depends what part of Canada too like Vancouver okay. would probably be okay right now okay but okay. if you yeah. went to like Edmonton it's going to be like negative 30 degrees I mean we have like literally right now it is like minus 12 degrees celsius like yeah. it's not not that uh. i mean yeah it's pretty pretty strong winter here as well these days but yeah i just like Four in general the, the 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 countryside in america and the uh, yeah. canada's kind of nice tomorrow is one and below is negative or not tomorrow thursday through saturday is one with lows between negative four and negative two and snow so that's gonna be interesting in seattle yeah yeah in Fahrenheit? No. Oh, you, you translated. Good. Look at you. Yeah, we're going to have a couple of sub-freezing days in Austin next week. But we also had a 30-degree day last week. So, you know, and that's Celsius. So who knows? Um, yeah. All right. Well, I think that's our 
chattering definitely enough for us it's 125 we've we've been talking amongst ourselves for way too long right <laughs> oh good. yeah the the, the the people are getting restless they're sick of hearing uh tiffany and i talk so why don't you oliver share your screen and take it away i uh, can do that let me just check whether that works uh well, that's the presentation screen is okay looks good to me I'll all right, um, so then welcome again, everybody. Um, as I just mentioned, I'm, my name is Oliver Drotboom. I uh, work in the Spring Engineering team. And what I would like to like, talk to you about this evening, this morning, depends on where you live, uh, is the, the Spring Application Events support. So just to give you a bit of context and um, what we're going to talk about. So, um, for one, there's like in the in the title, there's like spring applications. So we're definitely going to talk about the way we use application events inside spring applications. So you might write web applications, you might write uh, integrating applications, uh, batch applications. The work, the kind of workload doesn't really matter here. The, the the thing I'm trying to get to is how you make use of the concept of events within a spring application, which is to some or to some might already sound a bit like weird because people usually think about events when they talk about um, or think about um, application integration when we have multiple applications that uh, actually have or try to communicate with each other right like in in the microservices area that we uh, era that we now live in um, it feels pretty natural to send out a message to some broker and then some other system to react on that. And um, those, we, we usually arrange these systems to actually facilitate like different paces of development to enable teams to ship features faster and what have you. But oftentimes the, those, those, the, those arrangements with including multiple systems and distributed systems, they introduce a lot of overhead right um, in terms of like okay we need some extra infrastructure like a message broker and what have you and i've spent a, quite a bit of time in the recent years on thinking of how we can actually make the usage of or make use of the concept of events within monolithic applications in the first place so that doesn't mean that monolithic not meaning okay some arbitrary like a completely degrown um like or uh, uh, um, basically messy system, but rather um, a system that we can maybe compose of uh, logical modules, still deploy as a monolith, and actually use events to let the individual modules in that very monolithic system to, um, uh, to, to basically let the modules interact. And all of that to maybe just be fine with exactly that, or at some point actually extract certain parts of the system. In other words, starting with a slightly more monolithic arrangement, I'm not saying, I'm not arguing you should still build just one system and then basically split that up into five later on, but like any system you build will have some kind of internal structure and you want that to be modular and, um, and, and potentially be able to split that up uh, at, at some later point if you need if you have different scaling requirements or one part of the system grows too big or what have you and like discussing that with a focus on how do I actually implement that right how do I use spring framework to to do just that um, is basically at the center of the talk here and to um, to do that and to do to discuss all of that I'm basically trying to take you to three major uh, parts. One is just fundamentals, APIs, uh, programming model, um, how you would use, uh, how you can basically publish events and how you can, can consume events. Um, we will have a look at the effect that uh, the pub or publishing events has on like consistency and what can go wrong and what we have to deal with and how we have to basically set up our transactional arrangement around using events. And in the end, I'll come back to sort of give you a, a tiny showcase of um, how switching from, let's say an imperative style where one component explicitly invokes another component 
uh, and switching that over to one component publishing an event and the other component reacting to that in a monolithic system, how that changes the, the way the, the system is kind of designed and can be tested and, and taken forward and what have you. Um, I think uh, there is a, a comment or comments channel open in the, in the Twitch chat. So Paul or Tiffany, uh, feel free to interrupt me anytime in case you we have interesting questions coming up. Or if if or if you don't do that, then we probably have time in the end. To yeah, absolutely. Discuss. Happy to okay. interrupt you. All right. Very good, Paul. Thank you. All right. So in a spring application and we're going to see um, like a sample application I, I give you the the link to the github repo that i use for this talk uh, later as well um, in a spring application no matter what it actually looks like there are like fundamental abstractions provided by the framework that allow you to publish events and that allow you to consume events um, as you can probably guess like application event publisher is the interface that you would basically use to publish events and then there's different flavors of listening to events and i think all of this is best discussed if we have a look at a at an example um again the link you will get shared in i think in the reference section at the end of the slide deck so what i have here is like a um, um, kind of typical arrangement or an arrangement I'd like to use um, in my in my talks, which is about an, an e-commerce system that has some kind of orders to be completed. And uh, the order or the completion of the order, then uh, at some point, and that's what we get in get to in the later part of the talk, um, triggering, for example, an um, inventory update, right? So, um, basically like all the the line items within the order have to be registered in the inventory so that let's say we order like four tvs then we at some point should end up with four tvs less in the inventory than before the order uh, was actually submitted right so what you have here is a spring component it's uh, just a general a java class it's annotated with that component i'm using lombok here uh, to just generate a constructor that takes these two fields as arguments. And you see one of them is an actual domain component, like a repository from domain driven design. So it's, it kind of encapsulates any kind of data access, but that's totally none of our business for now. And um, we have a method here that is supposed to complete the order. So we just, that's being called from the outside. And we then use um, the event application event publisher to publish an arbitrary event. So some other event is just some some Java class. It's an it's an object. Um, uh, nothing. It, it doesn't even extend any framework specific super type or what have you. You can actually implement uh, Spring Frameworks uh, application event class, but that's not a necessity anymore. It's more that this thing is available for, has been available for historic reasons. Um, right, so you can just like, or in other words, at runtime, you actually get an instance of application event publisher injected into the class through its constructor, and then you just can call, call a method on it. Um, we then inv invoke some business um, method on the order. We basically change its state. Uh, we then, uh, I'm just logging st stuff out here. I persist the order. So the new state, the completed state gets uh, uh, persisted. And then we issue another, uh, another event basically saying, okay, this order here was completed, right? On the listening side, also, what what does what does that buy us even? Like, um, it buys us that we can write other application components that now don't have the, don't have no ties to let's say the order management in the first place. Um, we're going to discuss this in the context of like the inventory and the order later on, but let's stick for just sample app, uh, event listeners for now. So. Um, the traditional way of um, implementing those listeners was implementing the application listener interface provided by Spring Framework. Um, there has been, I'm actually not even sure when this was introduced, but does it say Spring 4.2 introduced the at event listener annotation um, that allows us to like on an at component class that allows us to express that we're interested in let's say the order completed event, 
right? So what happens at runtime now is that if th that code is called here, then the infrastructure, the event uh, broadcast infrastructure uh, in Spring Framework will actually find all listeners that are interested in an instant, like in events of the type, some other event here, and it will synchronously invoke in this case, that very method, right? And um, yeah, so it's kind of, it's, it's literally just an indirection for calling or that's replacing um, calling this code explicitly here, right? Um, and some kind of like logical decoupling. There's still temporal decoupling, which means that if the listener is not available at this time, like if there's no instance present of that thing, then the event will, will just pass. Let us um, just run this test case so that you can see, um, that's why I've actually put, uh, put the log output in there, that you see what happens. Um, and you see that uh, I had, I've added um, um, an interceptor that's actually uh, logging the entering of the complete order method. So you see that event was um, published in the first place. So some other event, and it's actu it actually, um, you see the log output here, right? Some other event is consumed. It's the output from the one listener. Then the, the business method is invoked. There is this completing order log output here. And then we register, uh, we see the order completed event being consumed by the implementing listener and by the annotated listener, right? So that's, that's uh, this one here and uh, this one here. You have influence over the, um, over the order these listeners get invented or uh, invoked by uh, just using at order uh, the at order annotation or implementing the order inter ordered interface. Um, so what what you should take from this here is that the the uh, event um, distribution or submission the invocation of the listeners are actual or are in uh, synchronous operations. So. Um, this method gets called and it's the, the, the execution of um, blocks basically here, right? So we're not, we're not seeing this method be invoked prior to the, like every invent listener successfully having been invoked. That also means that as soon as we um, actually, if, if an exception, for example, um, happens when we say, okay, uh, that's the way that this test case here works is, it says when, when we save an order, we actually throw an exception, right? So on this call here, that means that this invocation is not going to happen anymore, which you would, should see from, um, from uh, executing this test case. Um, you should just see, um, blah, blah, blah. so we receive, we enter complete order. We see the first event being published, some other event, um, and then we're already like leaving the uh, um, the order management, right? So there is no um, the the other events are just are just not in, invoked anymore. So not even published in the first place, right? So it's it's a mere the the standard um, Spring event publication mechanism is a mere way of decoupling um, just like different parts of the code base, different invocations. Let me just switch back to, to uh, that part of the code uh, or that, that piece of code here. What's, so the, you could ask the question, why would I want to do that? Or why would I want to use that uh, in the first place? The, the nice thing about like the using events in the first place is that um, this code here doesn't actually have to care like who about who is actually interested to be invoked, right? We're going to get to that when we discuss the, the inventory um, uh, later on, but we could just publish the event and then kind of magically quote unquote, like all other parties interested in that event will be invoked. So we get some kind of logical decoupling between that component and any other component that we might have to invoke due to the business reasons. Um, or yeah, due to some business roles. Um, on the other hand, we still have a very, um, that, that creates some indirection and might cause some confusion because you might just not be um, okay aware of what's going on, right? And 
due to the, to the synchronous nature of the distribution of the events, you still have some kind of clue if you add the extra logging of which listener gets invoked, where the exception is thrown. And it's kind of a very still quite simple um, execution model that you that you can easily reason about. And you can also, uh, I haven't used any transactions here, but um, in case we had an, a transactional on that method, it would still allow the event listeners to actually uh, roll back the actual the actual transaction, right? So whether that's a good or bad thing, we're going to discuss later in the in the transactions example. One thing that I kind of dislike about this arrangement here is that our like business component has to have um, or has to know about an infrastructure component. Application event publisher is a Spring interface, right? So we're kind of you know, we have to have this this service here around the the order completion and to to orchestrate um, like technical infrastructure in effect. So domain driven design actually rather thinks about events in a slightly different way. And uh, it does so by putting aggregates in or centering like behavior rules uh, around aggregates. And um, so aggregates, aggregates being like clusters of entities that, that for, have to follow some rules, some consistency rules. And um, Spring Data is one of the projects that has like, like developed the notion of a repository or has basically made a, offered you a programming model how, on how to actually implement uh, repositories, domain-driven design repositories. And what we can do with, with that or with that arrangement is that we can actually move the, um, that event publication logic into the aggregate, which has some nice benefits that I get to in a second. Um, let's sort out the, 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 the technical details first. So what Spring Data provides you is, or are two annotations that you can use on your, on your aggregate class, on your uh, entity, what have you. Um, which one of uh, one of them being at domain events and one of them being after domain event publication. So on the method annotated with at domain events, you expose all the events that have accumulated, like let's say across a business operation, right? You would, uh, in case you you we will see that in a second when we um, tr transfer the order from the state uncompleted into the state completed, we register an event. In this case, here in in within the list of events, and we would expose that list of events here on that very method. Also, there is a method to basically complete the unit of work, or um, we, we expose a method to do that, which would then kind of reset the the, the events. Right, and what that basically gives us is uh, the ability to just like in this case, I'm um, using a, a, a base class here to, to capture or to encapsulate these, these methods or this kind of state handling, event state handling within the aggregate uh, to just call the method register event here and create an instance. And I would just like register as the method should suggest um, that event in the list of events. But you could, if you, if you want to avoid extending uh, that, that base class, you could just like build this yourself using the annotations. And if we have that in place, we can actually, or we, we move to a programming model that just looks like this. The um, reference to the application event publisher is completely gone. Uh, we can just stick to like only the order repository and um, we can then call the method, the business method on the aggregate. We just call the method complete here. That would register the event within the aggregate. And the invocation of orders.save um, would then kind of know upfront, okay, order is exposing these annotated methods. And that's why the Spring Data Infrastructure then goes ahead, obtains the events recorded in the, in the aggregate, publishes them, and then uh, actually executes the, the, the persistence operation, right? So that, that save, that call to save is basically a, just like a, okay, finish this unit of work kind of thing. And it would, would 
automatically uh, publish these events. Let's have a look at how this just briefly, uh, let's execute the, or you see that just, it, it just looks the way it, I sh just showed it in the, in the slides. And uh, we can actually just run a very similar uh, test case that will produce the, not the same output, but it will just show you that the, that the events are actually um, um, ba -ba 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 -ba, received order, order completed for the yada yada aggregate class. So the annotated listener is invoked and then you see that um, the actual insert statement has happened here, right? So the, the, the takeaway from, from this part of the presentation is that if you like really consider working with events in a Spring application, then it's definitely worth having a look at the, at the uh, Spring Data um, event publication support because you can like avoid any technical references from your uh, Spring components to uh, Spring native event APIs and um, get, to a, get to a slightly more domain driven programming model here. I mean, there's, there's always the discussion around like, okay, how do you, do you tie your, your, uh, your domain code to a bit particular piece of technology, but um, in this case, there's some benefit you get from that. And there's nothing really uh, preventing the code from working without Spring Data, right? You could, um, and there's actually um, in um, some code that I show you later. There is uh, uh, there's all, there are also APIs for that allow you to basically verify that events have been collected on an entity without actually invoking that that Spring Spring Data ceremony, basically. All right, um, transactions. So. So far, we've discussed that like events are actually published in a synchronous uh, way. So um, as I said, it's basically an indirection via an event bus, but still like the event publication is happening and it's um, like, as I said, synchronous and it, it, the event listeners have the chance to actually interrupt the, execute, the flow of execution. So what, what does it look like from a just schematic point of view. So we have a, um, an invocation of a transactional method. Let's say our order complete method is an example of that or will be an example of that. <clears throat> and we, from that very method, we publish events. So that event gets published immediately and Spring Framework invokes all of the event listeners that, that are registered to be interested in that event. So once all of these have been invoked and successfully uh, um, yeah, or completed successfully, that method call is returning and the method basically goes on doing its thing. And at some point, um, like if the method is, is left uh, and, and no exception is happening for now, uh, there's a commit happening at the, uh, at the end of the transaction, right? Which means that all the state changes that have been made by the event listeners are part of this consistency boundary. So coming back to our example of the, the order completion updating the inventory, that means that we now like in a single transaction commit the change of the state in the order and also the update to the inventory, right? Assuming that an event listener is actually updating the inventory like state for the particular products contained in the order. This is a blessing and a curse at the same time, right? Depending on you, who you ask. It's a blessing because it's nice and simple. It's just like <clears throat> straightforward thing. You like in case of errors, we're going to have a look at those in detail or those cases. Um, we still have like consistency, like across the different functionalities in the system. But at the same time, it also incentivizes adding more and more stuff to the transaction, like broadening the transactional boundary. And at some point, this can actually grow like too big. And especially if uh, the logic in the event listener is not like, quote unquote, crucial, uh, then you it might even raise the question of, uh, of whether we want the event listener to be able to actually break the, or the, 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 the transaction, right? One thing I didn't mention um, yet is that there are a special kind of event listener called transactional event listener. I think we didn't, 
there's a bit of a or it's not the best naming I think we, we found for this thing because it doesn't mean that the event listener itself is transactional but that the event consumption is delayed until a certain transactional outcome by default that is a commit so let's take the again the order completion example if we want to send out an email saying to the or basically telling the customer oh your order has been completed then we don't want to do that in an event listener because like the event listener would like for one it interacts with infrastructure with the uh, email um let's say it would interact with the uh like smtp server so it, that which might cause the transaction um to to just run longer than than needed but even more problematic like if a subsequent event listener then fails and the the transaction rolls back, then we have sent out that email and uh, we just have to send another one to basically say, okay, well, we didn't mean it that way. Um, so it we, we much rather want to wait for the actual uh, transactional commit to successfully happen and then consume the, let's say, order completion event and turn that into an email that's being sent out to a customer. For that, there's like transactional event listeners um, they are triggered on transaction commit. And then finally, the or eventually that, that method call actually returns to the calling site, right? So there is already uh, like infrastructure in place in Spring Framework that kind of delays the event publication to the point of the transaction having successfully committed or rolled back. That's, that's a matter of configuration on the actual event listener. Let's have a look at, at what could go wrong in, 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 in those scenarios. Um, if the service itself fails, like this thing here, like if, if some, something in that method goes wrong and we see an exception, then we're still fine, right? Because like event listeners before that method might have changed state, but that transaction is rolled back and that change is rolled back as well. Right. Uh, if if the event listeners have like are all ordered um, to happen after that that method, then um, okay, they're not even invoked in the first place. So we're all fine. So um, we get a rollback, but the system is still in in consistent state. So we don't have a problem here. Um, if an event listener fails, like in um, a non-transactional event listener, so one of the uh, ones above here. Um, we li actually live with the same scenario, right? So that, that that listener might have like issued changes to the database, but in the end, the commit rolls back and those changes are rolled back as well. So it's, again, consistent state. If a transactional event listener fails, that's a slightly different story, right? So we, um, we already have, because at that point, we already have committed the transaction. So our order is already is completed. And if now the transactional event listener fails, not only we might end up with like invalid state, we also lose the publication, right? So let's say that we have this order completed event and we're supposed to send an email and we can't send an email because either the, the listener, there's some exception popping up or the system crashes in the first place then that event is kind of lost. So we're not, there's no, no way to, to recover that uh, from that for now, unless we apply some different measures. So I'm going to um, uh, basically sh yeah, show you a um, means to, to accommodate for that in a, in a second. Uh, I'm not sure we, we want to do the demo. It's basically, yeah, I'm, we would we'd just run, um, additional test cases and have a look at the log output, but we basically see that, oh, but um, maybe we, we let, me, uh, let, let me do this real quick because it's um, just give you one example. Uh, transactions, um, for that I will have to uh, basically turn on the transaction logging and that should give us a the test should complete, but we should see that this is probably the most interesting one here. Uh, the one that um, actually has one of the listeners fail. 
and that should it it still succeeds, but it should actually um, see that or show you that the um, the transactional event listener has received the order completion event, and it's been configured to fail in the test case, and that's going to be logged in the uh, like from the framework. That's because it's like showing you that okay, the transaction synchronization that actually submits the event through an exception, and then we're basically um, we're basically done, right? There's another listener that's actually just come uh, consuming the event quite nicely. But for that particular transactional event listener invocation, we're losing the event or and there's no way to, to really recover from that. Um, all right, so how do we deal with that? So the, the fundamental ideas and this, it's been part of a bit of R&D work uh, over the last years is that if we already have a transactional resource in place, uh, which like is we have if we start with that transaction in the first place, we actually know about all of the transactional event listeners that are interested in an event if it's pub as soon as it's published, right? So we can we we know about the transactional event listeners that are for example interested in that order completion event. And we can, within the very same transaction, like the the original, the the blue, the blue area that I had in the in the previous slides, um, we can actually write an event publication log. So we can, um, within the except uh, within the transaction, issue additional database updates to say, okay, this event listener has to be invoked with that event. And this transactional event listener has to be invoked with the very same event or what have you. And then we can actually equip the transactional event listeners or we can we can wrap an, an AOP aspect around them um, to find out about whether the transactional event listener is successfully completed. And if it did so, right, so we invoke the event is published, the transaction is committed, the event publication log has been written to the database. And now we start submitting the event to the actual transaction event listeners. And if the first one, for example, succeeds, we can remove that entry from the trend, uh, event publication log that we've written. Assume the second transaction event listener fails, that entry stays around, right? The second one fails as well, the entry stays, stays around as well. And um, the last one, let's say, succeeds again, and it gets its uh, its entry be removed from that from that log. That leaves us even in the in the error scenario. That leaves us with um, that event publication log, and us being able to retry the events, or let's say the application crashed when the application restarts. We could. Uh, scan that application or that event publication log and then resubmit uh, the events to the transactional event listeners, right? So they, of course, then have to be written in a way that um, uh, they can be invoked multiple times. Like, like there's some, has, has to be some item potency built in uh, in case they actually did the work already, but just failed to eventually succeed, right? Or see that, that, um, acknowledgement basically of of its successful ex execution but we at least do not lose the event publication in the first place and we can we can deal with that later on um part of that is has been gone into the spring framework 5.3 release uh, actually it's been just some infrastructure in terms of the way applications from the outside can modify the uh, registration uh, capabilities um, of um, like on, on on the on the actual uh, container so that we can basically plug in that kind of event publication uh, log creation and also the the application of the of the uh, resolving aspects around the transactional event listeners but um, the actual code that's doing that and that's holding the, basically holding all the functionality is in a project called Modulith. Um, it's been, it's like a Modulith event starter. And we're going to, uh, you just have to add that to your, um, to your uh, 
Spring Boot application, and it will automatically uh, configure a couple of um, infrastructure components that are pluggable strategies. So I think this at some point has to be renamed to the events-jpa starter. So for now, there is an implementation of that registry that works with JPA, but you could also imagine uh, having something like JDBC um, to be supported. Um, in fact, there is um, the, that's the one, um, one part of the story. So the way those, uh, that event publication log gets persisted, you see that's uh, with uh, happening with JPA here. And there should also be, I'm not sure why it's not showing up here. Um, the way that the event is actually serialized into the database is also pluggable with the default implementation now being uh, Jackson, basically. So the events have to be uh, somehow serializable to actually be persisted in the database, but that is also uh, pluggable, I think. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the two, the two uh, dependencies that are currently pulled in. And let's have a look at what this looks like um, when we ex actually execute um, uh, the, the problematic test case here, right? So uh, what kind of log output we see here. And that should slightly change. Remember, we're, we're doing the same thing. So we're still um, actually executing um, the, 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 um, um, kind of broken transactional event listener. Let me just ha try to find that. I've turned on transaction logging. So you see that, um, that, 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 that. So here, here, this is where the JPA event publications are actually inserted into the database. Um, then one transactional event listener actually um, succeeds. And that's why the why the event publication gets updated with a completion date. So we basically know when that happened. And then there should be, this is the final output here. Um, we actually leave the, the entire test case here with one of the event publications unfinished. That's basically the one, one of the two that we originally inserted that has not been uh, finished. I'm not sure I, why there's no output for the for the uh, 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 that that failed yeah there there it is I found it so the invocation of one listener of this uh, configurable transaction event listener um, failed you see that that kind of stack trace that that the framework previously threw or printed to the to the uh, to the log is now gone because we kind of handle that erroneous situation. We still, and that's why I, I actually um, raised the log level for that. We just have that one line of basically telling us, okay, the listener failed, which means we do not mark that uh, event publication as completed. And when the application shuts down, that this uh, event publication registry basically tells us what kind of publications there are still outstanding. And I'm using an in-memory database here, so um, I cannot really restart it. But as soon as we restart the application, those events would, would be um, resubmitted to the relevant uh, transactional um, event listeners again, right? Because they're kind of outstanding publications. All right, um, that's it. The, the, the library is, or that, that functionality is part of the, of the modulus project, um, modulus.org. Uh, it's kind of just a toolkit for building um, modulithic uh, Spring Boot applications. If you wanted to learn more about that, uh, then feel free to check that out, modulus.org. And uh, there you go. I think I have the links in the in the in the uh, back of the slide deck actually. All right, so that's the the transaction topic. Um, there's of course like a couple of recommendations to make, and um, something I haven't mentioned yet is that these event listeners can be pulled out of the synchronous invocation by just uh, annotating them with at async, um, which basically also takes standard event listeners out of the, the I can break the transaction um, loop. Um, and 
if if you have like transactional event listeners, you usually um, um, you usually want them to be at async as well because like the uh, even interacting with a with an email server, for example, it's you still don't want to to block the the uh, the actual uh, main application threat um, for that. But um, the the transaction publication event publication log gives you a, gives you a good a good um, tools to actually deal with error scenarios in in that case as well because the publication would just be um, registered either way. Um, right. So let's round this off with um, some or having a look at the architectural in, uh, impact that this has, like moving to an event based. Um, way of, of working e like with application components even inside a, a monolithic uh, system. So just to zoom out a bit again, um, let's take let's take the case of uh, the order completion um, having to trigger an inventory update uh, as the business case here, right? So we some someone from the outside decides, okay, the order is now completed, and that is supposed to trigger um, the uh, the update of the inventory, and that creates some kind of like it doesn't have to, but it like if you if you're not really careful, that can already like create a cyclic dependency between the two the two subsystems, the two modules, or whatever you want to call them, um, because the order now has to know about the fact that it needs to invoke the inventory. So we're kind of in the pre-events um, world for now. And um, I show you the, the, the way that the code looks like, and it's, it's pretty pretty symptomatic for a lot of code I see in code reviews when I, when I have a look at Spring applications. And the inventory by some means having to be able to traverse the order and the, the line items in it, and that already creating some cyclic dependency here. Um, I think that the the, the need for the order to know that it has to invoke the in inventory is the more invasive part. And that's the, the thing that we would like to get rid of. And we can do so by issuing an, 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 an event. Let's have a look at, before we con continue with that, let's, let's jump right into the code because that's even best discussed with looking at the code. So um, I've tried to basically simulate like the before state in that before package here. So the team, quote unquote me, has created like two different components in the system. One being the inventory that is just, it would just basically allow us to okay update the inventory for the order right in in here you you of course have some business logic you would have some some means to traverse the order the line items in it but i'm just logging uh, that the method was called here for now right it's it's transactional and the order management usually um that's very stereotypical for for application code i see it knows about um other uh, abstractions within the very same module, like the order repository, but also about other modules, high level interfaces like the inventory here, right? And then the arrangement naturally leads to this thing being transactional. And then um, our, we, we basically modifying the state of our very own aggregate. And then this is where basically all that, that kind of transitive functionality basically will would, would have to be plugged in right so the order management has to know that it needs to call the inventory to actually do that 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 has a couple of consequences and pros and cons so um, a very like obvious uh, advantage of that is that i can look at this code and i can like understand it like the entire use case basically right even if I, if there were other business requirements tied to the order completion, I would have to sort of integrate it here, which is again has advantages and has disadvantages. Advantages being okay. Let's say we 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 add in some kind of re rewards program, right? The customer for every order uh, she places, um, the, she actually gets some rewards points or what have you like a miles and more bonus program or what 
anything like that. We could actually let an entire team uh, build that functionality in a separate package. We could nicely separate that, but we would never get this functionality integrated into our system without adding the dependency to that new functionality up here and then invoking that other functionality here, which then again makes it a nice read, right? So we, we are able to understand, aha, uh -huh, if you complete the order, we have to update the inventory and then we trigger the rewards program, what have you. That's, that's kind of nice. That's the upside. The downside being that like to bootstrap order management, we actually now not only have to provide an inventory, we also have to provide an instance of the rewards program and all other functionality that's like coming up and like being centered around core business events, quote unquote, uh, like the order completion. And they would all end up here. There's a certain kind of gravity coming from, from that code. Testing becomes much harder, right? Because we might have to mock all of these uh, different, uh, different uh, dependencies. And um, you could even argue that why would the order completion process even have to know about like all those like third uh, functionalities um, that that are centered around it, right? Would I also, uh, because that being a, a transactional method, right? We're, we're basically creating a unit of work around all of this. And I think I mentioned that in the beginning, do I really want something like the rewards program to be able to but because there's a bug maybe in, in that functionality to actually break the transaction and complete the uh, um, prevent the order from being completed in the first place, right? So it's also about like the, the risk of, of additional functionality actually breaking the primary functionality. Um, and yeah, so the, let's have a, just have a look at um, the also let, to round this off uh, or that, that part of the story is how I would actually test that, right? Because I said it would become like more complicated the more stuff we add. So the, the usual way this stuff works is we use this, we want to test the order management and we have all the dependencies mocked to by some means. And then we define some behavior on the mocked instances and then we call business methods. And then we basically verify uh, other inventory, uh, other behavior actively invoked. And that's like, you see this, this is brittle because as soon as we add a dependency, we have to touch all of this. And even for the, like the implementation of a test for the order management, we kind of overload that test with some expectation on some interaction with a third module, or at least that's the way we, if we want to verify on that, that's the way we actually have to, to test, uh, test these. Um, let me have a look at that. Uh, yeah, okay, that's that's not interesting to, to talk about uh, for now, right? So this is this is the picture, and uh, I think you've got a pretty good good uh, uh, feel for okay. This has benefits. It's, this it's not like inherently bad or anything like that. It's definitely the way that I see most Spring applications written these days, right? And there's like there's also not nothing wrong with that because all of the downsides I mentioned, but um, yeah, you see there's, there's challenges, right? And we can, we can choose a different set of trade-offs here to actually um, change the picture slightly. And that's where I uh, want to get to with like, okay, this is the arrangement we, we, we've just seen, right? Order management, knowing about the component in a different module slash package. And we, what we want to switch to is basically resolving that, um, that explicit dependency. And we do that by making the, that completion of an order explicit. We turn that into an, an event. It's probably not surprising um, as of now. And uh, we publish that event and then we turn the inventory as into an event listener uh, on that order completion event, right? That also, um, uh, let's have a look at that, the way that this, the, the arrangement looks after that. Um, so the dependency from order management to like anything but its own module internal or package internal components is just completely gone, right? So it's we're 
purely focused on the, 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 the functionality within order. It's not much here, because, but because it's an example, but there could be. And um, the inventory has changed to just contain the very same stuff, but it also exposes an event listener, right? You wouldn't necessarily have to have that method in that very component. It could be a separate component if you want to, but that's just, just details, right? And that, like, of course, significantly changes the picture, right? It's not immediately obvious what else beyond the actual core um, business logic is going on here, right? Because we're not even seeing that an event is being published here. I'm, I'm totally um, uh, accepting that to, to be considered a downside by some folks. It usually depends on like what kind of code you've been uh, used to when, when uh, uh, with working with with that code, uh, with 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 these different styles, right? It's a bit like back in the days we had like XML configuration versus annotation configuration, and then like almost like tribes being built around these different approaches. But um, um, yeah, so it it basically makes this a bit more clear here. But at the same time, the in, the integration story is is a bit lost. Right, so um, funny thing, or the interesting thing is that also the way that we test this stuff changes. Um, one being, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, I would, wanted to show you the order module test in this case here. Yeah, so there's an there's an abstraction that's built into the modulus API um, that actually has um, um, that that allows you to. Uh, capture the events that are published during um, and uh, the invocation of some business logic, right? So we, we basically, we, we bootstrap um, a particular module, in this case, basically a part of that sample in, in, in the after order package. Uh, so we get an instance of order, manage, order management injected by the Spring container or Spring test support. Then we invoke the business method and we can actually, we then just quote unquote um, test that a particular event was published for that particular order that we created in the first place, right? So the, the, the interaction model changes from testing that a particular other component was invoked to we just test that a certain event was published. And then you could also on the, on the inventory side of things here, you could uh, basically test and that um, a particular event would trigger some state changes in the in the inventory, right? Um, that that being sort of it. Um, one thing I would so if we uh, um, there's the, the question that usually comes up with like okay I have um, the order management here, so with all the events and all the uh, like okay here is inventory is now listening for the order completed event. Is there a nice way to actually, that's all buried in the code. Is there a nice way to actually get a, um, um, a, a good overview about this? There actually is um, the Modulith project that I've pointed you to already um, has um, documentation support. And let me show that to you uh, using um, um, a project I've recently been involved with that's been in the, uh, in the area of the COVID-19 uh, response, like in Germany, we, we've been supporting the health departments and actually tracking down infected people. And um, the, the, the documentation you see generated here is coming from the, the modulus project. So you see that, okay, we have a um, directed acyclic graph here. It generates these kind of, as we call them, um, module canvases. So basically listing all the spring components that are inside a very package. And uh, let me, uh, ba, 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 which one is a nice example? Um, yada, 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 published events. Yeah. So it, it basically um, shows you all of the event listeners that are part of that package. And like, okay, this is the 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 event the class that contains the event listener, and it basically it lists you all the uh, the events that it that particular event listener is interested in, and it also um, explicitly lists the published events, and it even finds out about the 
um, the uh, the aggregate and it uh, the the methods that actually register the events. So the stuff, the Spring Data stuff that I've shown you before, that would actually um, be um, discovered so that you find your way to to actually the point that actually creates the the event. So um, there's a kind of neat way to. I'm not sure there's a yeah, encounters like content uh, infected people that had encounters um, is, is uh, listed here. So there is support. And if you want to check this out, um, be sure to check out the, again, modulus.org uh, uh, project that has all this stuff in here. Uh, it's basically documentation about the modules. It's not only plant UML documentation, but also those, those um, uh, module canvases. All right, uh, I'll show you that. Um, and with that, I think we're, we've basically covered all I had planned for today. Um, you should take away that there is like low level support for application events in monolithic applications uh, in Spring Framework. There's advanced support for that in Spring Data. Uh, you've learned how the transactions and consistency actually plays into that, how we deal with error scenarios, how the modulus domain event um, module helps you with that, and how that actually changes the way you would look into uh, or you would design your the interaction between components in a monolithic system. Um, maybe a comment on to basically get the, the or close the loop basically towards the question um, okay, like that's been all like inside a monolith. How do I actually now deal with other systems that might be interested in these events? Um, the, once you, you get kind of a feel for these, working with these events internally, it's very easy to basically look at all the events that you publish internally and then basically decide um, which of them might be interesting to other parties. And then just like for, for the components that publish these events, write an, uh, an event listener, an internal event listener that just like finds out about the event being having been published internally and then using a Kafka template or what have you, uh, any kind of technology integration to actually broadcast that event into some infrastructure that will then take care of uh, taking the the event to other like systems to to actually uh, or to, to get them consumed by them. So there is uh, um, you have that that translation step where you can basically use the events internally and like then pick and choose which of them you actually expose to the outside world and uh, that would just naturally blend into that system. So it's not something that that's prohibited or it's not not possible in this arrangement, but it's, um, yeah, it can, it's, it's just a natural progression from, from what you have here, what you've seen here. And uh, that actually then uh, those events, again, being consumed by some internal component and that then in turn uh, creates some connection to some outside infrastructure. If you're living in a system of systems environment, which we probably uh, are in the first place. Um, yeah, all right. The sample code that I used for the for the talk is on that in my personal GitHub. Uh, the Modulith project is living is living there as well. And um, yeah, I've discussed a lot of this stuff in a more architectural context in a talk called "Refactoring to a System of Systems." Um, like, there's a couple of recordings of uh, of that one in uh, on YouTube. But um, I think I've just chosen some some random one not sure why i've chosen that one particular but are there any questions so far paul tiffany uh we haven't had a ton of specific questions we had some discussion okay. about living in uh uh michigan and we also had okay. some discussion about modulists.org okay. um there was some confusion because we tiffany posted a link and when you clicked yeah. it it went to a HTTPS website, which was not um, modulus.org, but it was in German, and then went to just straight modulus.org, and that redirected to the GitHub. Um, so we're I'm assuming the, I, there is some sort of 
Apache I'm, or Nginx it, server. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I might, I might have the. If you use it that way, I think it might just end up on the web space. I, well, not that module list. The There's an S. And when you do it that way, if for a font or so, if you remove the www and do HTTPS. There's like three oh. things it goes to. Yeah, it goes to something about Harmony Lodge or something. Oh yeah, that's that's a friend of mine, like a music group. Wow, oh, Jesus. Yeah, and you have to like go to it, like you have to proceed with the scary thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so don't do that. I have to fix yeah. that. That's just like me being unable, not not being able to properly set up websites. Um, <laughs> so I I'd happy uh, happily consult me on on architectural <laughs> advice, but not on setting up. This is why you're a Spring developer and not a. Uh... Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's like okay. That shouldn't be there. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's but, all good. Uh, yeah, no, no. Uh, just modulist.org and or just um, if you Google for it on GitHub, then you yeah, can we posted the GitHub uh, direct link as well. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. So if you have any questions, like later on, ping me on Twitter, um, on uh, email, just Google me, or just open up tickets here and modulist questions, what have you, Stack Overflow questions. It's all good. Awesome. Yeah, we're getting stuff like nice stuff and great topic. Thanks for sharing. You're most welcome. Yeah, usually I try and ask some of my own questions through a talk, but I, I'm not really a Spring developer. The closest I come to writing code is like a for loop in Bash. Uh, and so a lot of it, like the concepts were interesting, like uh, talking yeah, about yeah. Uh, modulates and stuff, but a lot of the Spring code was... Uh, yeah, sure. over, over my head. So, and I didn't want to interrupt with like super basic questions that oh, everyone else in the world would already understand. I'll get back to you with my bash questions. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll help you uh, configure your websites and you can help me with. Oh, uh, yeah, that will be helpful. Introductory okay. spring. Oh, yeah, that's good. We can, we can do that, Paul. Right. Cool. Tiffany, any uh, website stuff too? Anything going on for you? Uh, any questions, any comments, any uh, ad more admonitions? I'm even more on Spring than you. <laughs> hey, I wrote a Hello yeah. World app in I Spring learned... once, so I'm at Aww. least a junior developer. So proud of you. So yeah, I learned, definitely was learning some new stuff here, but not, I don't know enough to be able to ask like actual like Spring meaningful questions that aren't just like very basic. Oh, good folks. Oh, good. Cool. This looks cool um, all right. Well, unless anyone has any final words of wisdom, we can probably wrap this thing up. I'd be fine with that. All right. Cool. Uh, so let me go ahead and hit the magic button and let's end things. All right. Okay. Thank you for having me. Bye. Psst, turn your camera. Oh, oh, I forgot how to stop the stream. Oh no, where is it?